In studio, Sean Wilt. He is the trustee for the Berkeley County Republican Club. Good morning, Sean. How are you, sir? Is Alonzo Perry still involved with the club? Yes, sir. He is still our club president. Still the president. We were having a debate as to whether or not he had to resign that uh, position when he went to work full-time with Riley Moore or not, so we didn't know. Uh, no, he's still our president. Uh, Alonzo, he's been a very good president. I, I've been with the club now for about uh, four, almost five years, mm -hmm. and I've been through uh, three presidents, and every one of them has had their strengths or weaknesses. They've all been great. Alonzo, uh, in all uh, clarity, uh, he and I ran against each other mm -hmm. for – for president of the club we both kind of ran on the ran on the same platform in terms of change for the club um you know it was a close thing he won uh i fully support him he's done a lot of things that, that myself and other people wanted done in terms of the club uh for more act not activism mm -hmm. but to be active in the community uh information a lot of people for myself when I came to the Berkeley County Republican Club, uh, it was I wanted to, a place where I could find out information mm -hmm. about local Republican politics, uh, regional, national. And I kept up on stuff. But at the same time, there's a lot of local things that slide under that people never hear about, just like there is national. And we have people that are, that are members that come to us that want to be active. They want to help with events. They want to help with volunteerism. We have people that come to us that just want information. And we're trying to be, we're trying to service all of our members so that when they come to us, we can say, you know, this is, this is what's going on. If there's an issue that we don't know about, members are welcome uh, to come in, talk about, bring those up. And sometimes we get involved. Uh, real quick uh, answers for me on this one, Sean. Who are the two presidents you're referring to that were serving before Alonzo? I'm sorry? Who were the presidents that served before Alonzo? So before Alonzo, uh, originally when I came to the club, we had Renee Wibley. Renee Wibley, and, yes, I remember. And she, she ran was, against Jason Barrett, I think. I'm sorry? I think she ran against Jason Barrett. Uh, she, she, yeah, yeah, she, yeah, did, yeah, yes. she ran against Jason primary, Barrett. Yeah. We had her, and she was the president through the COVID term, which, which was real hard on her. Um, and then uh, we had Bob Thomas, who came in after her. And uh, oh, yeah. Bob used to work here. Yeah, he's he did news here. Bob was a great guy. I, I, I don't want to was is a great guy. Uh, I spent a lot of time with Bob. We did some volunteer stuff together, uh, and I learned a lot of things from Bob about stuff that I would have never known because of his life experience. Mm -hmm. And he was a He's a great guy. I, I, every time they said we need somebody to go with Bob because we need two people for this event, if somebody else didn't jump, I did because Bob was a, uh, is, is a, a great, great guy. guy. He did the morning news here uh, for several years, and he was my uh, partner in the morning for the longest time. Great, great guy, great sense of humor. Oh, hey, hey, before, and a lot before we, of very interesting life experiences. Oh, yeah, he had a moose with his pickup truck in Maine, and the moose just got up and walked away like nothing happened. That's how big <laughs> the moose is. Uh, hey, tell me about the Republican, uh, the Lincoln Day Dinner that's coming up. About the Republican? Republican Club Lincoln Day Dinner that you have coming up in April. So April 20th. We have the Lincoln Dinner. We have an annual Lincoln Dinner every year. And uh, this year it's going to be at Heritage Hall in Inwood. Very nice place. The food is absolutely amazing. The wait staff, everything. It's a great place. Very, very modern, but a very nice setting. Uh, we're going to, so we're doing kind of a, a combined event this year. Because it's the 2024 election season, we're having a candidate, sort of a, a meet and greet the candidate type of thing. So anybody who's a candidate, who Republican from Berkeley County or Jefferson County, because the Berkeley County Republican Club is, is having this dinner in conjunction, in cooperation with the Jefferson County Republican Executive Committee. We've been doing some things together for the past two years. And we're having like a meet and greet the candidate forum, or not a forum, but a meet and greet thing. Um, our keynote speaker, who is retired Lieutenant Colonel Allen West, will be there as well. And that's from 4.30 to 6. And then from 6 until 9 is the actual dinner, where we'll have obviously dinner and we'll have a few people who get up and speak and some other things but then alan west lieutenant retired lieutenant colonel alan west will be our keynote speaker um 
as I don't know if you guys know or not, I'm sure you probably do. He was uh, a member of Congress for a period of time. He was significant in the Tea Party. He was very vocal against the lockdown shutdowns that uh, certain governors, especially Abbott, put into place. Um, the the dinner itself is set for a ticket is seventy five dollars or two tickets for one twenty five. The tickets include the beforehand meet and greet reception. People have a chance to talk to candidates from both Jefferson County and Berkeley County. There's going to be local candidates. We've got some state candidates that are also going to be there that are running for some things because a lot of them happen to live, well, not a lot, but we'll say a fair number, happen to live here in the Eastern Panhandle. And they come to our events and they're, they're, some of them are members of the Berkeley County Republican Club or the Jefferson County Republican Executive Committee. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah. Uh, What's the normal, the average attendance of the Lincoln Day dinner, Sean? For the dinner? For the dinner, yes. So I've been to three because of the original year that I joined, we couldn't have one because of COVID. And every year the attendance has gone up. The first year I would say we were probably, I, I want to say it was somewhere around a little over 100 people. Last year, um, I think when it was all said and done, it was close to 150. Uh, this year, we're hoping for, obviously, you always hope for more. We want more. We're, we're trying to get the word out earlier. Last year, we had some, some incredible speakers. We had some, some big sponsors, Tim Pool from the, the Tim Pool broad, uh, broadcast. He was one of our sponsors. He also helped us get some of our speakers. Um, last year was, uh, was definitely... I would say a step up from the previous two that I'd been to and not in terms of uh, venue or food or anything, but more of in terms of uh, attendance. And we had some nationally known people who are speakers. And while they weren't household names per se to everyone, they are household names to a lot of people that are conservative, uh, maybe conservative independent leaning type people excellent speeches we had the amazing responses quick uh, follow up on that what's the difference between the republican club and the republican executive executive committee so my understanding is is the executive committee now i i, I don't want to speak for jefferson county because i don't know but i would assume that they're the same wherever you go but for instance the berkeley county executive committee republican executive committee their their job one of their responsibilities is is for instance um when we need poll workers they try to find help people who want to be poll workers they try to help get the county to give better poll worker training um they also try to find representatives for like for instance i live in the adams morgan district they they try to find representatives of people who are willing to volunteer to be representatives for for the adams morgan district or for the different districts um they do some fundraising type events they try to find candidates to run for races things like that mr gilstrap <clears throat> we started this show talking about um civility of of discourse at on in politics so kind of bring that around here to the last segment as as a member of the republican club uh i presume there is a a, a democratic counterpart some of of some ilk albeit perhaps not well populated at this point i don't know what do you see this is an election year and we've got divisive candidates and we've got the the civil discourse on political matters is is at a low point in in my life and i've i've been around the sun a few times so we're how do we start bringing parties back together how do we start making it so that people are less ugly to each other and are allowed to give full voice to controversial issues without it divulging into name calling and such so what I'm going to say, I would like to make clear, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a clarity type person. Anything that I say doesn't reflect on anything about people, members, or whatever, the Republican club. They're just my personal views. I, this is the thing. I am all for civil discourse. That's the way it should be. That's as simple as it is. But, because everything has a but. But, as long as you have groups that come out or you have politicians that come out and say, 
this person has voted this way or this person supports this and you need to harass them, you need to target them, that is unacceptable. And until we start punishing people that do those things, like Maxine Waters, for instance, and, and I will be the first person, if a Republican does that, they should be punished equally. The law should be applied equally to every person, no matter what letter comes after, before, or in your name. Until we start punishing people and saying it's not okay to come out, and, and I'm a free speech advocate, but there is a huge difference between, for instance, if you and I have a disagreement and I go out on my Facebook page or I go live on something and say, he needs to be harassed everywhere he goes in public. He needs to be anything that's like that. As far as I'm concerned, and I believe if you ask most rational people, they're going to tell you that is a call to violence. Until we put a stop to stuff like that and it becomes that's not okay, civil discourse will continue to go down. And, and there's one other thing I'd like to add to that. Everybody talks about partisanship, partisanship. We're not living in the age of partisanship anymore. We're living in the age of tribalism. It's, it's literally that simple. You are the tribe of this or you are the tribe of that. And in every one of those tribes, there's smaller tribes. Partisanship, uh, I once heard someone say, Americans, what makes you American besides freedom is you have no, uh, you, don't, you don't compromise. Americans are uncompromising. That's a lie. Shelby Foote, a great author, who I met once, uh, actually said, our entire government is founded on compromise. And he's right. Our entire government is founded on compromise. The, the problem with that is it very much seems like if you look through the record of things that have been voted on and stuff like that, the compromise always seems to shift in one direction. And what does that mean? It, and it always seems to shift in the liberal direction. It always seems that Republicans will not stand their ground and when we do, when we do stand our ground on something, we're, we're called all kinds of crazy things because we choose to stand our ground because of our beliefs. But liberals hang their freak flag out. They all get behind it. And they're not, they're not called out. They're not whatever on it because that would be wrong. They want to label some kind of an ism behind that. I watched you guys' show Friday. Mm -hmm. And... I wish I could have been here. I really do. I, I wish I could have been here because uh, there were some things that were said, that, especially by one commentator who... Try not to tap the table, Sean. That really resonates in the microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, there's one person who, who especially his, his um, facts or his understanding. It Are you seems, talking about Larry Schultz by yeah, chance? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, like oh, what a, a surprise. He's not, well, <laughs> this is the thing. This is the thing. He made this comment several times about, well, the Republicans had the House. They had control. And, and I'm surprised that no one here made the comment of when did they pass it so that when you have control of one half of Congress, you can make things happen. It doesn't work that way. You have to have either control of both houses or you have to have enough control of one and enough support in the other one that you can make something happen. You can have you can have 100% Republican or 100% Democrat in one of those houses. If you don't have support or control of the other one, nothing will happen. So you can sit back all you want and say, well, they had this and they didn't do anything. Well, yeah, because that's how it's going to work. But I think the point he was making was point in time that the first two years of the Trump administration, oh, the yeah. Republicans had both houses, had both the Senate and yeah, the, yeah. the House. No, no, and, and, and the I, White House. And, and the White House, that, yeah. But if you don't have 60 votes in the Senate, it still can be difficult to get anything exactly right. passed. Oh, exactly right. Yeah. So it's, it, it all really yeah. devolves into that. <clears throat> and, all, and all of that, and, and thank you, if, um, but all of that is, is looking in the rearview mirror. You know, what has happened has happened. The feelings that have been hurt have been hurt. Blood has been spilled has been spilled. Now we're in an election year that I think should be a time of perpetual optimism. You know, we can always make things better than they are now. And when it comes to partisanship, you know, I've said it on the air, pox on both their houses. The partisanship or tribalism, which is actually not a bad term, um, is bipartisan. You know, it's, it's on both sides. So whose responsibility is it? 
to step forward and say, okay, today's the day it stops. Today's the day of compromise, so and you can come from the left or the let right. Let me propose you a question then, because I, I was thinking about this because I was listening, and I was thinking about this on the way over here. Let me propose you a question. Let's say that a Democrat comes in and says to their Republican counterpart, I got this bill, and it's going to solve this problem. And the Republican looks at it and says, yeah, yeah, no, no, you're right. It will solve this problem. Sit on, I, sit on your hand, Sean. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, if I don't have, if I don't move him, I can't talk. So, and he says, you're right. It will solve this problem. But then he reads further on and he says, well, why is this in here? This doesn't have anything to do with that problem. That happens in the United States government way more than people realize, a lot more than people realize, even people that are informed. Like, for instance, if you ask people, like they, they want to talk about this last bipartisan uh, border bill, I bet you, uh, out of curiosity, who here besides me actually read the entire bill, the entirety of that bill? Right, that's what I'm talking about. If you read the entirety of some of these bills and you ask, start asking questions, wait, why does the border bill, which actually gave no money whatsoever, not one dime to border protection, border patrol, anything. It was just called that. But it gave all kinds of stuff to all kinds of other things that had nothing to do with it. Why is it then that the Republican is blamed for saying, no, no, wait a minute. And, and this could go either way. I'm a reality person. This could go either way. Why is it that the other person who says, no, 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 wait a minute. I, I don't, I don't, like this because while yes you have something that may solve this problem you're tying all this other stuff to it that has nothing to do with this situation and the argument of well we have to put all these things in because congress can only get so much done in a certain amount of time is a joke congress could get a lot more done if they were forced to get things done and they could be forced to get things done there's people that's made proposals, but they'll never happen because the people that have the power will never willingly give it up, which is why we'll never see term limits. We'll never see things like Congress being them not being allowed to give themselves raises. There's, so is it hopeless? No, it's not hopeless. The pro, the, the, I honestly believe, and I, I have believed this my entire life, and I have, I'm a weirdo. I, even as a young kid, I saw through my parents and family members who were military service people and they sit around and they played cards and I was allowed to play with them because I was the only kid that was, that was serious. How things affect everyone from the elderly all the way down to kids. And you're only going to see change when enough of the people in America care about making that change happen there are too many people that i know personally and i've changed some people's minds and people that i don't know but you hear them oh i don't get involved in politics quick quick question we're about to run out of time you're not gonna have time to answer there's no chance sorry we are yeah. we're gonna have to get to our final minute here this